Maybe as a sort of framing of the discussion, I can propose or try as an attempt to characterize all these diverse and uh, sort of kaleidoscopic discourses. And I'll go by saying that maybe uh, Boris proposed a model inherited from uh, the postmodern anthropologist or the critical anthropologist. We can discuss that, but coming back to Johannes Fabian, and maybe we can also link that to other critical anthropologists like Michael Tosig, uh, but definitely uh, a self-critical and, uh, so to speak, postmodern anthropology. Uh, then I would like to to call Zeynep uh, maybe the um, post-colonial archaeologist, which in itself is a, would be an interesting thing to, to pose because the discipline of uh, archaeology uh, often tends to forget about its uh, post-colonial unconscious. And then it gets tricky with our further speakers. I would like to, to call Yazid maybe the Pasolinian scriptologist. Uh, <laughs> scriptology being a new discipline that he has it just inspired me. <laughs> and maybe we could call our friends Shahan and Zahra either the political ecology or maybe even stranger, the radioactivist, a mix of what is radioactive and activism. Um, so how can we now make these awkward characters speak to each other? Maybe I'll go uh, first with a, a cross question, maybe for Boris and Zeynep uh, first. Um, uh, a cross question, let's say. So um, I would like to ask to Boris, by a reference that uh, came through my mind listening to you uh, regarding the role of infrastructure in its presence and absence. I remember some debate of uh, contemporary anthropologists referring to the fact that Levi Strauss, when he was with the Brazilian uh, Caduveo tribe in the 30s, Levi Strauss would always make a point of uh, put the electric antennas and the electric wires that existed on site with the Caduveo out of his photographic frame. So he would always try to photograph the Caduveo by avoiding the electric antennas or electric wires to appear in the photograph. And um, by this anecdote, I would like to know if you could elaborate a bit more on the issue of infrastructure, which is one of the main issues gathering us today uh, in, your, in your discourse. Uh, how do you see this issue of uh, infrastructure in the, in the present tension that you arised with uh, the political concern for, uh, for uh, right extremism, for example. Uh, and the, and the, the, the cross question to, to Zeynep would be more simple, would be, did you, uh, since you're working on um, a sort of uh, historical critique of archeology span and the role played by objects, uh, did you ever thought of taking this as a Freudian or an Agatha Christie metaphor? I would be curious to know if you would go more with Freud or more with Agatha Christie, <laughs> or maybe knowing that Boris, maybe you. Yes, uh, uh, I, I think it, it's actually clear that, that, that I'm much more interested in, in uh, uh, I would call it ideological infrastructure of the, of the whole, this condition we are now talking about, um, for which it is difficult to say whether it is historical and what is our uh, perspective. Is, is this this sovereign uh, view on history or it is this historical, and this was my point uh, already, uh, historical te temporality today, very, very problematic. Uh, Johannes Fabian as anthropologist is actually very traditional Marxist. From the, from the Marxist, uh, uh, critical Marxist school, I wouldn't call him postmodern, and he would probably didn't, wouldn't like to be called postmodern. He, uh, he has this, this uh, critical, classical, critical um, uh, uh, motivation to look into the differences and what he was 
actually articulating in the book was precisely the temporal difference being created by a type of knowledge, which is anthropology, and what is his Marxist con critical contribution is to say that this temporal uh, difference is actually social. The di social meaning that it is a difference that defines social relations of exploitation, domination, etc. And this is this infrastructure how I wanted to, 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 to look at the, at the railway as being not simply a, an infrastructure of transportation, but, but uh, an infrastructure of, of, of as I, I, I said and used, it's of, of this uh, non-synchron temporalities and social, social relations. And what was uh, interesting for me was actually, are actually, continuities, not, not this these breaks, his turns, historical, like, uh, I don't know, the, the question, you know, uh, <clears throat> uh, uh, the, the moment when the, the, Bag, uh, the Baghdad, when, when the, the Ottoman railway project changes the route after the first, second war, world war, the, the second uh, world war, or as some historians, both on left, on, 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 on the right, would call the second 30 years war in Europe. This could be also <laughs> another, another pers perspective. But my point is to, to, to look at, to, at these differences, and especially this temporal difference, as being constantly reproduced by the capitalism and uh, today being deployed uh, by, by, by the power, power in, in this neoliberal global, global world with migration, etc. The temporal difference is always here. And it is uh, the challenge for all of us to follow what uh, Frederick Jameson once also 80, 83, I, I, I think, uh, in, in his political unconsciousness that uh, uh, wrote that begins with this famous, famous sentence, always historicize. But how to, how to historicize, this is, this is an open, open question. So, <clears throat> how to historicize if you wish to welcome all those multiple temporalities, right? Even contradictory temporalities. Absolutely, and, 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 and we know we are, according to the, to the, to the uh, uh, ruling ideology, we are supposed to live in a post-historical time after after, as Fukuyama uh, uh, <clears throat> would, would say, after the ideological development of humankind uh, kind has uh, arrived at, at its destination, the goal, and uh, we are supposed to, uh, to live in, 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 in this uh, final, the last word of this uh, development, uh, liberal uh, democracy, Western type liberal democracy, etc., etc. So this 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 is crumbling now, uh, today before our eyes. And uh, uh, what is actually ch challenging is to see what the dangers are now brought about by by this falling apart of the post-communist order and, and the, the promise, utopian promise of the end of history and, and, uh, and the further development of the Western world into, uh, into a democratic paradise. And uh, this is why I mentioned also, also fascism, the danger of fascism, the fact that uh, not as Bloch would say not all of us live in the same now, but it's more, more dangerous. Not all of us live in the same past. <laughs> so, um, and especially from the perspective here in Berlin, which is in, in Germany, this powerful country that, that, that gives this impression for all of us of being in the eye of the storm, where it, it is quiet, you know, it's a, quite a cultural garden. We can exchange it, but around it, if we open these windows <laughs> around it, this, this, the, it, it becomes much more, much more dangerous. And this is what I think that this railway can teach us. It can teach us not about 
how to discover the truth of the past, but how to uh, discover the truth that this past never ends, that it is continuing, it is even more dangerous than that it, that it was before, and we have no means, both intellectual, <laughs> cognitive, and political, and why not? Military, violent, to, 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 to stop, this, stop this development. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Boris. Uh, Zeynep, would, would you like to, to address this, uh, this reference either to Freud or to Agatha Christie? And I will, and I'm not going to hold either side. In fact, what I would like to suggest is that when you get into research, into historic research, things get very complicated. I too have read my Fabian and my Freud and my Jameson and certainly my Said. And I think I'm influenced by all of them. However, when you get into research of your case studies, things turn upside down. And the temporalities, the contradictory temporalities that I so fell in love with just were no longer there. When I read the accounts of even the Western archaeologists themselves, there were so many, I, and I have studied daily life on the archaeological site. The relationships were so complicated, mm -hmm. and it, there, I couldn't think about two temporalities contradicting each other because, after all, the archaeologists work for many, many, many years on these sites and they're human beings. Then there is this character in the middle, the Ottoman um, officers. Where do they fit into this temporality scheme in the sites, in the, um, uh, at least the archaeological site within the Ottoman Empire, which is many, many, many sites. So what I would suggest is that uh, theory is very seductive. It seduced me tremendously, and in my earlier work, it came across probably as stronger. But I'm turning more and more to, um, to my case studies and digging into them, reading my sources very carefully. For example, Agatha Christie, I loved your analysis of the Orient Express. Agatha Christie has another book, which is not a mystery. It is her memoirs of going to the site, taking the, um, the train to Baghdad, mm -hmm. and what she sees from the train, what she experiences. Maybe some of you know this book. Its title is Escaping Me. Uh, but it's a straightforward memoir of her, experiment, of her experience with mm -hmm. her husband on that site. And in fact, there are very obnoxious sections of it when she sh talks about shopping for the uh, archaeological dig in London. And then the food, how they eat. I mean, there's a lot, a lot of information on the daily um, um, details. However, there's also quite a lot about how she and her husband relate to the locals. And as much as I wanted to pursue my post-colonial uh, dichotomies, I couldn't when I read that book. You it what, got sorry? You, you said you what? You dichotomies. Couldn't. I wanted to pursue the dichotomies that I loved so much from my theoretical readings, but I couldn't, couldn't. pursue them. Um, and I'm not saying there is a right way or a wrong way of doing that, but I think as a historian, I am beginning to take theory with um, some grain of salt. More precautions, yeah. <laughs> Very but, precautions, but then... you know, and, and it's, really, it's helping me a lot, mm -hmm. uh, but I also figured out that I could take a theory and fit the facts into it. Mm. But then I said, I'm not going, this is not, this is not ethical, <laughs> this is not good. And I'd rather leave um, matters with question marks mm. than try to bring um, rigid explanations to them. So I'm not going to take, and Freud, I mean, I don't even know what Freud had read, if he had read the accounts of uh, archaeologists at the time, 
or whether he was just theorizing on the basis of something else. But mm. I'm not a scholar of Freud, so... But I would like to ask you what about repatriation of objects, as you referred, because the, the issue of repatriation of objects nowadays is very crucial to a lot of uh, um, former, col former colonized countries in regard to Western post-ethnographic museums that like to call themselves Musée des Arts Primitifs or so forth. Oh God, yes. And it seems to me that repatriation is typically the issue that delays temporality to the present because it's somehow never resolved. So it, it's, it's typically an example of a, a device or a status uh, around the object that delays uh, the conversation around it to the present. Uh, this is such a can of worms, you know, obviously. It's not going to happen, repatriation, you know, the Pergamon uh, temple is the, um, it's not going to be returned. But maybe to, the... But how, what I'm going to suggest with this is if the, if, and you may be following these debates about the humanistic encyclopedic museums like the Metropolitan Museum of Art, museums in Germany, and the Louvre versus the nationalistic museums, mm -hmm. which use politics uh, associated with um, uh, antiquities such as Iran, Iraq, Turkey, Greece, Italy, all of them. Um, I think this doesn't hold any any truth, but that is not the issue. What I think would be interesting, if the great museums, which are not going to return the antiquities, mm. could at least acknowledge the history of the acquisitions. Mm. In a much different way. It than would be a very instruct, very edu you know, educationally, it would be very valuable yeah. to do that, so that when school kids are taken to the Pergamon Museum, they know something more than the history of the temple. Yeah. Okay. Thank you, Zeynep. Uh, as we are risking to be short of time, I'd like to, to jump to, to the two performative lectures by Yazid and uh, Shahana and Zahra. Um, I think there, I mean, it, it was really astonishing as a discursive and visual device. It felt like we, were, we had overcome both the, the documenta and the Venice Biennial for a moment, uh, especially because of the, the, the role that nature uh, or the landscape uh, would play in both of your lectures, I think was very striking to, to, to gather them in, the, in, this, in this session. So uh, Yazid, I, I was thinking uh, of this permanent tension that you, um, you, you, you played out between, on the one hand, a fluidity of the landscape that uh, ends in an eloquence, fluidity and eloquence on one side, that you want the landscape to speak, but then on the other side, decep deception of landscape and muteness. So on, on the one side, fluidity and eloquence. On the other side, deception and muteness. Uh, how can this be, how, how could you elaborate on that? Uh, and especially, I know it's one of the first uh, such a performative lecture that you've, you've shaping. Uh, so I would be curious to know uh, uh, what roles, you, what roles, different roles you could uh, devote to nature in your work, and then maybe uh, Shahana and Zahra can also try to elaborate on this idea of nature as uh, something contaminated, nature as something um, radioactive or uh, subject to sabotage, for example, as you referred. I would be curious to know if. Uh, the historical sabotage that we learned about the Ottoman railways through Zeynep's work, who explains really well in her book how those uh, sabotage was happening, uh, or how could they foreground the future sabotage if you believe that future sabotage of our connected world are supposed to happen, what concrete shape those future sabotage could take? Um. Uh, actually, I'm, what I'm interested in is the way we navigate ourselves through the, uh, the knowledge that comes from landscape, whether it's visual, 
or whether it's pre-constructed, socially constructed or politically constructed. And what attracts me most is the fact that e how each one of us or how each regime is really navigating through that kind of knowledge what is sort of uh, focused on and what is put aside. And uh, what drove me into working on this project is also the way how history is repeating itself. So uh, I'm so much uh, interested in what the Palestinian Authority, for example, uh, is promoting through landscape and the new project, the, the whole new liberation project, uh, which is uh, instituted in uh, the Palestinian Authority state building project. And the way landscape is looked at, again, landscape is really here uh, been looked at as something muted and something that is, uh, is uh, dedicated as an infrastructure for the new uh, state. Uh, and there's muteness in that pr uh, uh, project. And there's also a sort of uh, different temp temporality that has been introduced, and which is the temporality of uh, uh, the new liberal uh, format of Palestine as a way of uh, looking at the landscape, and uh, in contradictory to, uh, uh, to the liberation project and how the liberation project at a certain point was also induced by the political uh, will. And the uh, landscape has formulated in the 60s and 70s as, a, as root, roots to the, uh, to the uh, Palestinians and as a folkloric uh, uh, historical primordial uh, relationship. Uh, so it's, it seems that each time we're tamed on a relationship constructed, pre-constructed uh, politically on how to relate ourselves to the landscape. And now it has changed because the political will really needs to look at the landscape in a different way. Mm. And uh, therefore, I took the train as a pretext to sort of uh, focus on that relationship. And it could also be multi-layered. I mean, these are two narratives. And then you have the, the tourist, which is uh, WGT, I mean, a text from Mitchell the, on the Holy Landscape. That was really the text that you've seen on the uh, screens. And uh, he really claims himself as a tourist who is uh, but a, a very consciously working uh, uh, a laborer that he wants to help in, uh, and assist rather than uh, what uh, uh, the narrative of Mark Twain, for example, to visiting the landscape of Palestine. So uh, what I'm saying is that you can also dissect the landscape into multi-layers. I mean, look at the work of Rajesh Hade, for example, and he looks totally different on, uh, he's a Palestinian writer, and he looks at the landscape totally different. He looks from his memories while walking with his family in the landscape and uh, the way he really related himself to uh, the flowers and the rock formation. So it's uh, actually, it's a process of navigation uh, through knowledge, visual, and that socially constructed, whether through class or uh, uh, politics, let's say. So, I mean, that's my interest. And so it's not about muteness and what is speaking in the landscape, whether the landscape can speak or not, other than how, what you want the landscape to talk about and uh, what do you yourself mute and uh, how you can construct that as an ideology. Mm -hmm. So, Very blunt response. Is there any inheritance effect from the 70s Palestinian painters who already dealt with the landscape, like Sliman Mansour or uh, yes. people that you know very well in your mm. family, even? Um, uh, inheritance in terms of uh, uh, collective inheritance. I think we're still uh, stuck in the iconography of uh, that landscape. So we, for example, we, w whenever uh, the idea of the olive tree, for example, present itself, you look at the iconography of the 60s and 70s, but then the way you practice it as an individual, you, you look at your land as an exchange value, so you don't look at your land as part of the whole, you know? So, I mean, we practice something, and what is constructed uh, uh, inside our head in relationship to the image is more nostalgic to the past. Mm -hmm. So I think there's a discrepancy between practice and uh, uh, iconography and imagination. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Yazid. Uh, Shahana and uh, Zahra, maybe you'd like to so take when, forward um, on the sabotage, maybe? Absolutely. Just um, to, to briefly talk about landscape first, when Boris uh, described uh, 
the Orient expressed as, as one without windows and instead full of mirrors looking inwards, that kind of reminded me of um, what Timothy Mitchell talks about is the first fictional account of Europe written in Arabic in 1882 of these two Egyptians who go to Paris and they go to a wholesale supply store and get really lost in it because it's so huge and every time they think they've come to an exit, they realize it's a mirror and not an exit. So he uses it as this sort of metaphor of Paris being an endless series of exhibitions, a kind of labyrinth without exits. And I think we sort of also started our project by foregrounding the centrality of representation in our lives, of image making, of sort of mediating reality through images and organizing views. Mm -hmm. And so our interest really was to see how the railways, not just materially, but also work as a representational device, as how they evoke the nation and how through facilitating travel to regions, not just travel, but also conquest and occupation, they're also reframing landscapes. And that's a sort of really violent unseeing um, that is done on various regions in India. And I think sabotage also works on those two levels, that it's a material destruction of the railway itself, but it's also about, on a symbolic level, exploding and shattering the image of the nation that the railways evoke, right? Yeah, and I think, again, uh, to, to make that connection with landscapes, I think a background to our interest uh, to the specific direction this project took was uh, a lot of our work is, uh, a lot of our research is based in different sites of mega development in Pakistan, and we were becoming more interested in and trying to understand how these sites become sites of uh, the intersection of uh, uh, extreme environmental damage and uh, extreme militarization and securitization of these landscapes, uh, as well as uh, sites of ethno-nationalist struggle. So most of these projects are based in spaces where there is already an ethno-nationalist struggle mm -hmm. happening against the Pakistani state uh, by ethnic minorities. Um, and so for us, looking at the history of railways and the, the kind of contemporary fact of their resurgence uh, was especially interesting because the railway or, or specifically sabotage uh, against the railways big, has this clear continuity from uh, the colonial, uh, the, the resistance to B uh, British colonialism and then the resistance uh, by different ethno-nationalist groups to the Pakistani state. And so it becomes representative somehow mm. of that kind of uh, the Pakistan's appropriation of the, the colonial project in that sense. And so we were interested in that continuity. In the lineage of yeah. Saboteur. Yeah. How do you say in English to the one who sabotage? Yes. French would say <laughs> saboteur. Uh, 